Okay, Popper, since we do this as OHL stories, I've got a story for you. Okay. Building a gingerbread house is stressful. I don't need this kind of aggravation in my holiday life. That's all. Here's my thing with gingerbread houses. They're a great little craft. I do them with the niece and nephew. I'm sure you, you did them uh, with your daughter at home. Correct. But why? They never get eaten. You end up throwing them out. They're a waste of money. Just take your money and, and invest it. Save your two ninety nine dollars or whatever it costs you because you're never going to eat the house. And even if you do eat it, it tastes like crap. The candies in it are garbage. The gingerbread itself is garbage. Head down to the stone crock, pick yourself up a gingerbread cookie. It's 10 times better for you. Okay. I, I'm so against them. It's interesting you've talked about the cost particularly because it's like we planned this, which we didn't. This particular gingerbread kit, 20 bucks. Oh my God. Habitat, it's just a waste of money. It's, it's for Habitat for Humanity. You see, okay, it's worth it. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. right? So it's a great client gift. If you've got employees that you actually like, let them do the craft. We had fun doing it after I got over the initial stress. And I will fight you though on the quality of the candies slash the icing. I did more of the consuming of that than I did the decorating. Yeah. When have you ever met sugar you didn't like? This is a good point. This yeah. Is you, you have an issue. Like calling a spade a spade. You might have an issue. I do not disagree. I cannot argue that. You have seen yeah, yeah. me in media rooms, the OHL round. And you know, I get rounder and rounder with each media room passing. Well, so do I, but I'm more uh, leaning towards the, the lint chocolates on the buses. When we were handing out the lint chocolates, and uh, you might have consumed about nine between Sault Ste. Marie and Sudbury. Yeah, but no, no, not, not I think I had nine for that whole trip. <laughs> I don't know, buddy. I don't know. But some <laughs> of the players didn't few, want their lint chocolates. I quite a few wrappers. Happy. Quite a few wrappers. <laughs> Holy cow. We had to clean the bus, just our area. I love me some lint chocolate and anything else with sugar. I, I like that you supported uh, Habitat for Humanity, but I'm, I'm, again, telling you, go to Stone Crock in St. Jacobs, get the gingerbread man there. They're much better. I don't just, look, the, the gingerbread house will never be eaten, but I did consume the candy along the way. And it is for a good cause in the community, so why not with the shameless book? Speaking of uh, a good cause and linking it back uh, to the OHL, big fans, the Wetzel family, I uh, picked up my four cases of Grill Guide cookies from Miss O, Aaron Wetzel, the other day. Uh, yeah. Oh, so, those things are so good. But I, I like to tell myself I'm just uh, helping the, the Grill Guides. That's all I'm doing. It's just a donation. Uh, chocolate vanilla or mint chocolate? No, it's the mint ones. That's It's the only option. I don't know why they even sell the chocolate and vanilla ones anymore when you can get the mint ones. They're much better. So you can eat the vanilla that's nah. Nah. But I'm with you. Mint chocolate, solid girl guide cookie choice. Every year when I walk into the odd, every year they're set up at some point and I look at them and I'm just like, take my money. Like you got me. I'm, I'm not, I can't walk by here. Here's your $20. Give me my cookies and don't tell anyone I'm buying four boxes. It is what it is. They're so good. I'm old enough to remember when $8 would have got you four boxes. But that's wow. Yeah. Two bucks a box, Popper. Two Jeez. bucks. That's yeah. all right. Last year, uh, Jay Taylor, owner of Morty's, his daughter was selling them. And I said, oh, I'll buy, buy a couple boxes. And he goes, oh, they're up in my car. And he gave me like a box of boxes. I'm like, Jay, this is not good. I can't have that. I, I have no self-control. I cannot have these in my house. It was really bad. I went through way too many boxes than I care to admit. And I started getting looks from family members and friends that I just started giving away boxes so that I didn't have them because again, I have no self-control. That was a smart move on your part though. Cause yeah. you're great. I'd be the same way. If it's in the house, it's going to be eaten by me. I had four for breakfast. Four. I'm not going to lie. Breakfast of champions. Yeah. Uh, on the OHL front and, and this is completely shameless, but somebody that I was hoping that we would have on this podcast in the not too distant future to share some stories because he'd have more than a few. We really, unfortunately, like 78 is not near long enough to walk this earth, but Larry Mavity described uh, by our colleague, Jeff Merrick as a giant in junior hockey passes away. So as I said, shameless, we would have loved to have him on the podcast, but we had the opportunity. And, and for me, I wish it was earlier, but recently anyway, to see Mr. Mavity when we would make that one trip through Kingston and just great to have a guy like that, that didn't mind you walking up to him 
and having however brief those conversations may have been before a game between the Rangers and the Frontenacs. I think Merrick put it best. He, he was a giant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> his reputation, a giant, but also as a man. He was a big, big man. And he did a lot for this league, a lot for Belleville, a lot for Kingston. Um, I never met him. I was too intimidated to go up and introduce myself in the media room because I think I only saw him in there twice. Um, but I remember the first time going to Kingston, I thought to myself, oh, I wonder if I'll get to see Larry Mavity. And I walk in the media room and I saw a couple older gentlemen sitting along the, the windows in the media room and I'm signing in and I'm like, I wonder if one of those is him. And I didn't know what he looked like or anything. I just knew the name from my uncle's time as a Frontenac and him and my grandfather telling me stories about his time in Kingston. And all of a sudden I heard that voice and I went, there's Mav. <laughs> <laughs> that one was him. Um, it, yeah, gone way too soon. I wish uh, we would have had him on this podcast because you know, all the people um, talking about him on social media all talked about the stories he had and he'd been around this league in the game of hockey for quite some time. It would have been great to sit down and get some of those stories out of him. It goes to show kind of where we are at in this league. And I think, again, shamelessly, but I think, I think that's one of the great things that this podcast is going to be able to provide is, is a little bit more of that context because this league has got great fans today, make no mistake about it. And the way the league has evolved to where it's at now with its social media presence, with its office staff that is far larger than it ever would have been back in the infancy of this league. I think you kind of, sometimes anyway, certainly the younger fans would get focused on the game as it is today. But when you think about a guy like Larry Mavity and, and Brian Kilray, who we've already told you is going to be a guest very soon on this podcast, there are so many of those names that, that sadly are getting to that point where, you know, the sooner we get them on the better because that generation of the Ontario Hockey League is is making its way right out. It is. And that is, for me, the, the heyday of this league. That that's when, you know, hockey was at its, for me, at its best. It was nowadays, for better or for worse, depending on how you look at it, a lot of these kids know each other. Um, they're in contact with one another on opposite teams. They grew up playing, obviously, AAA in certain cities, and then they go to these other cities and, you meet friends, you see it all over social media, uh, people on opposing teams hanging out and stuff and uh, players talking before and after the game, texting and whatnot. Back in those days, even, even when I played, like I hated the opposing players. Didn't know them, didn't want to know them. If they got traded to our team, it, it took a bit for us to take a liking to them because you just, you hated them. They were your opponent and they were standing in your way of the ultimate goal. And you saw that a lot back in those days, there was pure hatred, whether you liked it or not, it was hatred. And it made for some great rivalries and some great entertaining hockey. So I'm a little bit older than you, but look to that same day for me, it would have started much and older. I'm, I'm older than you. Uh, it would have started early 1980s, but honestly, watching those teams like the Brantford Alexanders and the Peterborough Peets and the Kingston Canadians coming through the Kitchener Memorial Auditorium to play the Rangers, uh, and, and you could sense like there were some rivalries that you just couldn't wait to when the Niagara Falls Thunder were in the league. Come on. Like, yeah. you, love, you love those big old North Bay Centennials teams under Burt Templeton and so on and so forth. I mean, it was, it was, Pretty nuts. The, the Sioux Greyhounds and the Rangers had a legendary rivalry. Anyway, uh, we're cutting our teeth roughly the same time. We certainly had that, that same era of hockey, to be sure. So in light of that, how much were you geeking out ahead of today's podcast? Almost as much as last, last week when we talked to Killer. Um, <laughs> Jack Miller, I, I said it in the interview with him he was my childhood. Like that's between him and Jim Van Horn. That's where I got my sports. Like I used to watch Jim Van Horn on sports desk on the weekend and I'd watch my uncle's OHL games on OHL game of the week with Jack Miller, that voice. I would never forget it. Cause I, he was what I watched. I didn't watch as much NHL because my uncles were playing. So I wanted to watch them. Um, and mom, even the games that I'd miss, she'd record them all on VHS and I'd watch them over and over and over again. It was always OHL game of the week with Jack Miller. So I was like, um, when I first 
uh, spoke with him over the phone as a young broadcaster, I was totally geeking out. I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy knows who I am, is talking to me. And I used to watch him on television. I thought it was so cool. And um, we were talking off air. He just has that delivery as a broadcaster or even just a person speaking. He just makes you feel like he's your friend. And you, you may not know him, but just that voice, the way he talks, it's just so friendly. And he's just an unbelievable broadcaster, a great play caller. And uh, getting to talk to him, obviously a great storyteller too. Yeah, that indeed. He's uh, his voice is unforgettable. It's synonymous with the Quinty region and the sadly now defunct Belleville Bulls from the Ontario Hockey League. Who knows what the future holds? But we certainly get a glimpse into the past with these stories from Jack Miller on this episode of the podcast. So many things that we could talk about from over the years, but most recently we have the news of Larry Mavity. I'm sure this is somebody that you knew well and dealt with an awful lot. Uh, what are your reflections? Well, it's amazing. Uh, I was here, obviously, when, when Mav came back. And, and in as much as he was born in Woodstock, uh, he grew up here. Well, his dad had a shoe store on, on Front Street downtown here. and was very well known. And Mav came up through the minor hockey system and played for some local teams, played softball. He was an all-around good athlete, uh, but he'd be played most of his career in the 60s and 70s before he retired. And it's kind of funny. My recollection is the day he came into the radio station, what was happening is Belleville originally was a Tier 2 team. It was in the Provincial Junior Hockey League, and at the time Guelph was in there as well. Uh, the Guelph Platers, they were Tier 2. So it's 1979. Uh, it was kind of a kooky situation in that the Bulls came into effect uh, it was a guy by the name of Howard Hazen. He was a Wisconsin guy who apparently was close to the Kennedys and for some reason wanted a Tier 2 Junior A hockey team in Belleville. They didn't have really any expertise, so they hired this figure skating coach, basically, to coach the team. Uh, they hired, well, and the general manager was a guy named Emerson, uh, so he was kind of pulling the strings. It was a disaster. The team gets off to an 0-7 start. And Larry Mavity had just retired. He finished up his pro career with the Brantford Alexanders uh, senior team back in the day. And so he comes back. He's looking for something to do. And the team said, well, we need somebody to sell some season tickets. We need somebody to, to um, sell some advertising. Uh, you interested? And Mav didn't have anything else to do. So he says, okay. So the team gets off to an 0-7 start. So everybody's getting fired. Uh, they got rid of this. Bobby Dyer, who really was out of his element, and uh, this Dave Emerson was gone. And so Mav, they go to him, and they ask him to be coach and GM, out of the blue. So he comes into the radio station. Uh, Jack Devine, who was my predecessor, but Jack Devine was also at one time the president of what today is Hockey Canada, but then was the Canadian Amateur Hockey Association. Plus, he was also a member of the International Ice Hockey Federation. This is my, my predecessor, who I worked with for a number of years. And, and Mav came in to talk to Jack and these other local people who bought the team. And so that's the first time I had really met him. And that would have been in 1979. He's kind of bigger. He was a big guy, right? And you always knew when Mav was in a room. And this whole thing coming out of the blue, okay, you're not going to sell advertising anymore. You're going to run the show. And he ran it. And he started moving players. He moved some guys around. I remember there was this one skinny defenseman. And it didn't take long for Mav to decide not. I mean, this is the Provincial Junior A Hockey League, 1979. Skinny defenseman. There was just really no, not much room for skinny defensemen. So we made a centerman out of him. So Doug Gilmore turned out pretty good uh, in that respect, uh, you know, and, and that's what got his career going. But he, he knew talent and he knew where it belonged. So the, it was a 12-team league back then. And Belleville ended up finishing fifth. The next year, he takes them to the Centennial Cup, which for the longest time had since become the RBC. Uh, and then they were in the OHL. It was just that fast. He certainly commanded a presence when in a room um did you ever butt heads with him oh what time is it how much time have you got 
<laughs> I was intimidated uh, because you talk about the presence and, of course, big burly guy. And, and what I found out over the years, I mean, his bark was pretty good. His bite could be pretty good. But until you were able to sift through and find, okay, the bark is over here, but here's where we're going to end up. It took me months, and uh, it was just a whole new thing for me to work with somebody like that. I mean, 15-year professional hockey, he was a big bruising kind of a guy. He'd be, obviously, his voice was big and raspy and loud, and it would be funny, of course, back in those days, guys, right? There's no social media. There's no internet. There was one way fans were able to stay connected with the hockey team, especially on the road. They were listening to us. That was the way you got it. So Mav's wife used to listen to the games and everything I would say. And sometimes he would just find a payphone after the game and call her at home just to see what I may have said. <laughs> and I was, I'd get on the bus and, and I sat in front of Mav. Like most coaches sit in the front seat. Mav sat in the second seat in the right-hand side. And I was in the front seat. So, I mean, I'm within earshot. Of course, everybody in the bus was. Uh, he would say, why would you say such and such? I said, well, Mav, that's what happened. Yeah, I know, but why would you say it? And it was just such an intimidating factor. And then as time went on, and we had a pretty good relationship going anyway, and so you could always kind of wait for the bluster, work your way through it, smile. You do, like his, uh, his wife at the time, Billy, she used to say, well, you know, it's a long way from his heart. And uh, she was right. He, he was, at times, a very big bit, uh, teddy bear, but you wouldn't want to cross him. You, you talked, Jack, about the origins of this whole team in Belleville. And obviously, it's still got hockey in the Senators. But back in those early days, and, and you know, the, the community of Belleville, what did a major junior hockey team mean to that market? Well, you, you hear the term big fish, smaller pond. Uh, the market itself is bigger than the city's population. So it's like you guys, uh, where you have a regional approach. Uh, in Belleville, there's Belleville, uh, Quinty West, uh, there's Prince Edward County. And we're all kind of uh, one butts up on the other one. So the actual market's probably about 175,000 people. But back then, what we had for years and years and years was a junior B team, uh, the old Belleville Bobcats. And when Tier 2 came along, it was something new, but people understood Junior A. Uh, and because it made such an immediate impact from its success, uh, hockey back in those days, as you guys know, it, it wasn't for the faint of heart. Uh, but the NHL was like that, uh, certainly the Ontario Hockey League, and it kind of drifted on down. So there were games were probably on average three and a half hours long and, and lots of drop the gloves and away we go. But the, the Bulls were as tough as they came right out of the gate because Mav built them to what hockey was in the day. And as I said, they had a lot of, a lot of success right off the bat. Their second season, uh, they end up finishing in first place. They had one heck of a team and they go to the Centennial Cup, when all is said and done. You couldn't find an empty seat in the place. And if the fire marshal ever did a count, uh, they probably wouldn't have been too impressed uh, just because people were everywhere. And there were some really interesting players back in those days because you transitioned into the Ontario Hockey League. Danny Quinn was their first overall pick, went on to a long NHL career, uh, played alongside Mario Lemieux. Marty McSorley was 18 years of age and never drafted on an expansion team. He couldn't skate, but he was strong and he was willing to work. And Mav found a spot for him, despite the fact that the scout said, we can't afford to keep this guy here on an expansion team. He can't skate. He's 18. Uh, Mav said he overruled the scouts. Said, no, I'm keeping him. By the next year, Marty McSorley, is an all-star in the league, gets signed by the Pittsburgh Penguins again as an, uh, he's a free agent. And there were a lot of guys like this that just captured everybody's imagination. And so from Tier 2 to the Ontario Hockey League, the Bulls in their first year in the OHL had set a record for most points by an expansion team. They had 50 points that year and just missed the playoffs. 
And so, I mean, the success carried right on through, through in the playoffs the second year, uh, and if not for the loss of some draft picks. And by that, I don't mean they were traded away or anything. But Dan, Dan Quinn gets called up to Calgary early. Uh, they had drafted Ally of Brady in the first round, and he played all of 13 games, banging up with the Toronto Maple Leafs after playing as a 17-year-old in the Olympics for the U.S. Uh, they had drafted Pat LaFontaine, but he did not come. But all those guys could have been on the roster by their fourth year. They could have won it all. So the success was established from the get-go, and it meant a lot, not only to the fans here, but they knew that Bulls were putting Belleville on a map in an area where they did not have that kind of, of uh, outlook in terms of being recognized outside the community. Just 18 years later, you're calling an OHL championship. What was that yeah. moment like? Well, the moment was something. Uh, if you ever see Gary Agnew, don't bring it up. Uh, <laughs> the ironic thing about it was uh, Mav had left, and uh, he left the year before that. Louis Crawford became the head coach. So uh, they've got a pretty young team, but they put some things in place, and, and nobody expected they were going to, uh, to do what they did. They ended up finishing second, actually, in their division, but then they were coming on at the right time. London Knights on the other side were going through the same thing. They didn't finish first in the West, uh, but they were coming on at the right time. And so we end up in the finals, and you've got to picture this. Uh, it's a best of seven, obviously. Belleville takes a three-game to one lead in the OHL final, and everybody's getting giddy, perhaps a little bit too much. So London comes back, and they win games five and six. So now we've got a 3-3 series tie. Game seven, and again, the place, the old Yardman Arena, uh, which has gone through a major facelift uh, in the last few years. But uh, what they had to do, there was, there was a second arena at the time connected to it. And so they had to open it up and bring in monitors and the whole thing. I forget the score after the first period, to be honest. Five to two. Uh, stands out in my mind. But Jonathan Chichu scores five goals in that game, and, and Belleville wins it 8-2. to two. So they win their first OHL championship in that fashion when people weren't expecting them to do it. And yeah, 18 years might sound like a lot, uh, but Belleville had some pretty good teams over the years. But let's face it, everything's got to go your way when you're going to get through four rounds of playoffs and then finally win it all. Uh, to be able to call it, that's obviously a huge thrill. It was really something else. But when they went to the Memorial Cup that year, uh, it's in Ottawa, Bulls beat out the 67s in the second round of the playoffs. It wasn't supposed to happen. Ottawa was the elite team in the division at the time. So double, almost every game goes to overtime. They knock them off. So now Ottawa's got all this time off from – the second round of the OHL playoffs. It's about like five weeks until the Memorial Cup starts. And where is it? It's in Ottawa. So bottom line is they stuff the Bulls in a hallway. Uh, and you guys probably know the Civic Center and the way it used to be. But there was a hallway where they'd sometimes set it up as a media meal down there. No dressing room. Just basically this hallway. And they put the OHL champions in there. So there was a big to-do about all of that. Meanwhile, Ottawa's fresh, they're healthy. They start running teams out of the rink as best they could. Acadie Bathurst was the Quebec major league team of uh, the champions that year. Um, Marc-Andre Fleury, pardon me, it was Longo who was their, uh, their goaltender. Uh, Calgary was in it from the West and then double and Ottawa's in as the host teams. Ottawa's running everybody. They're running guys out of the rink. Guys are getting injured left, right, and center. Headline in the uh, Ottawa Sun, uh, calling them the Bank Street Bullies. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> Belleville had a lot of key injuries. Like, I'm talking about four of their top five players. They go into the last game of the round robin. Ottawa jumps out for nothing. Justin Papineau takes a, a Luke Sellers elbow, knocks him out with a concussion, and Belleville's got nobody. They fight back win that game in double overtime. Uh, the, the thing that was too bad, everything was left on the ice in that game, and then they've got to play a semifinal game again against Ottawa like 36 hours later. But it was that game that I couldn't, 
I probably had as much emotional feeling calling that game and the comeback as I did in game seven of the OHL championship. <clears throat> Pardon me, just because of the nature of what it was all about. Because it was guts, glory, everything out there. It's everything you wanted to see. I can't help but think, Jack, that a guy by the name of Brian Kilray may have had something to do with that hallway that the OHL champs got stuffed into, looking for any edge the shrewd <laughs> son of a gun could find. Well, of course, we're reporting all of that. Plus, the team hotel wasn't exactly where you'd want to be. It wasn't a bad hotel, don't get me wrong, but but there were certainly better hotels to the other clubs, and this was assigned to Belleville. So everybody's got the conspiracy theories going at the time, especially the fans. So that was just amping everybody up that much more. I uh, saying, you know, you, you're already coming in with enough of a rivalry with the team. You've already beaten them in the round robin. You've already beaten them in a best of seven playoff series. Uh, how many times have you got to beat them in order to, to advance? And as it turned out, Ottawa, uh, they won the cup that year, uh, the next game. But bottom line is, yeah, people thought, oh, this, this is on purpose. Yeah, it's got to be done on purpose. Their way of just kind of setting Belleville back any way they could. Who knows if it was or not, but it was a great story. We were talking to uh, Killer last week, and I asked him this question, but I'll ask you, how would you describe the Ottawa-Belleville rivalry? You saw it a lot. I saw it all. <laughs> uh, well, and, and let's face it, uh, it would have been a lot like the old, like the real old London Windsor rival in that respect. Uh, you've got a couple of old time coaches, of course, who wasn't back in those days, but all the way through the Ontario Hockey League history of the team. And, and they had so much history. You're playing them 10 times a year, eight to 10 times every year. So if that's not enough, and then of course, all of the playoffs, uh, that they had to go. The rivalry was intense. But the thing about the rivalry was on the ice was on the ice. When the game was done, there was probably more socializing between Belleville management and Ottawa management than anything. I mean, the respect factor was there. They want, like Killer and Mav, they wanted to beat each other. Like the players wanted to beat each other. There was never any let up as far as the on ice rivalry was concerned. But when it was done, I think there was more friendships between the two teams and even on the broadcast side of things, uh, not that we have any reason not to be, but it was just, it was one of those unique situations that you wouldn't necessarily find today, not to the same extent as it was back then. We didn't have the same thing with Peterborough. Uh, we didn't have the same thing with Oshawa. Um, we had something close with Kingston, but Ottawa, there was the friendship. And it started at the top between Mavity and Kilray. Both of those guys, lifelong minor leaguers at a time when the NHL, for the most part, was just six teams. Um, so those opportunities didn't come along very often. But they were great friends. They played against each other, played with each other. And so from that time on, as much as they wanted to beat each other, uh, that friendship really rolled on down. They had lots of trades between one, one another that uh, certainly worked pretty well for both teams over the years. And so they, they had that relationship. We talked about that rivalry, Jack, and there have been several in the Ontario Hockey League still to this day, but I don't think I, we're all going to agree here. And I think that the rivalries, they're just not quite the same as that almost visceral hatred you could feel for another team. <laughs> But you also talked about when the Bulls came into this league, uh, they were a, a rough and tumble team, ready to play the kind of hockey that was being played. And that makes me think of another story that Graham Bonner shared with us on one of these recent podcasts about a game of the week in Hamilton, Bill LaForge's Steelhawks and Terry Crisp's Greyhounds. Yep. And before the game could even start, Jack, so here we are, you talk about from the broadcast perspective, the pre the showcase of the game, right? And there's a pregame brawl before there's an official on the ice that goes on for, depending on which wives tale you believe, anywhere from about 10 to 30 minutes. I remember watching it. Uh, that game was on Global. And it was before I was ever involved in those telecasts. It was early on in the whole Global uh, Saturday afternoon games. And I was in this tavern. Okay. Uh, but nonetheless... <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I just went in to watch the game. They got it on, and it was the old Mountain Arena that that game was being played in. And, like, the game hardly I, – I don't recall how long it took before the game finally got started. And I do believe it was from that that the league started putting linesmen on the ice uh, during warm-ups because this was a war. And it was on a small ice, so you can imagine what it was like. And it's all being televised. And right across the province, and uh, the league was very uh, embarrassed about the whole thing. Uh, that was back, I think, around like 1984, but it's funny you bring up that particular game. We had things like that over the years, especially, you know, somebody would want to cross the center ice line uh, during warm-ups. Uh, there wouldn't be anybody on the ice as far as the officials were concerned. Belleville and Kingston were just notorious for that. Somebody was going to do something dumb and, and just get things started. And uh, it didn't take much to get it started, to tell you the truth. Belleville, Kingston, probably more than any from our side of things. Peterborough, the same thing. It's funny, Jeff Tui uh, tweeted out this picture uh, last week. And it was, about the first, and it was after uh, the announcement of Mav's death. And talked about the time that, that he and Mav, and Jeff was a trainer at the time, Dick Todd as they had coached. Peterborough Peets. And so the benches were very close together in Belleville at the time. Mavs uh, at the one extreme of his bench and Tui as the trainer, he is almost within arm's length of, of Mav. And Mav's screaming over at Tui, who's mouthing back at Mav. Mav's yelling at Dick Todd. Craig Cox, I don't know if the name means anything to you or not, and a big tough guy. Uh, played some games with the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, he, he had a little NHL career big guy. So Mav and, and Dick Todd and Jeff Tui are just yelling at each other. And, and Craig comes over and says, hey, Mav, you want me to go over there and maybe talk to Dick for you? That, that was Craig Cox parlance for uh, not talk, but uh, Mav had to call him off and then pull him back. But it was that kind of hatred that the two teams had back in the day. And and Dick Todd was in Peterborough for years. And Mav was in Belleville for years. And, and if you want to talk about a hatred, it was probably those two teams, Belleville, Peterborough, that had it as much as anything. Peterborough back in the day, uh, they used to refer to themselves as Canada's team. And they were very successful and uh, went to a lot of Memorial Cups. They won a couple of Memorial Cups along the way. They had the strut as an organization. And uh, they had this dinky little rink uh, ice surface to this day with square corners. It was certainly, the team was built for that and it was a tough place to play at any time. We had the international ice surface and so it was tough for them to play. But Ty Domi would come in. Uh, and I can always remember, of course, Ty's like five foot eight playing junior hockey. And uh, we had a guy, Troy Crowder, and the two hated each other. And Crowder's about six six. Ty's about five eight. And they fought every game. They, they would tie, well, Ty would tie him up as best he could, and then he'd look at the Belleville bench and stick his tongue out at them while, you know, Crowder's <laughs> trying to get his arms loose. Uh, there was no love lost, believe me, between the Belleville Bulls and the Peterborough Peets. You mentioned at the start there about the, uh, the OHL game of the week. That's where I first knew who you were, because I used to sit in my basement as a seven-year-old and watch my uncle's games on OHL Game of the Week. My mother had recorded them all on VHS or whatever, and it was Jack Miller with the call. And then when I actually got went to work in uh, Wingham um, in radio, I sent you a demo, and you said that you would get, uh, you'd get back to me and take a listen. I was like, oh, my gosh, Jack Miller just listen to me yeah I'll be calling <laughs> you next week on that Chris yeah okay perfect yeah <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't great going back listening that far back but um you, you go from that kind of stuff to obviously uh the Belleville games and then you're um filling in on the Ottawa senator side um from time to time what was it like though when you got the call that or when you found out that uh Belleville was losing uh the Bulls well it wasn't a call it was uh it was face to face and um, Gord Simmons, uh, the owner at the time, and I'll never forget it, it was the day before my birthday. So he uh, calls me at home and he says, uh, he's in town, can we meet? I said, yeah, sure, nothing unusual about that. But then he said, meet me in George Burnett's office. We never met in George Burnett's office. Uh, anytime we got together, we'd 
you know, we'd, we'd talk at the rink or we'd go have a bite to eat or something. We never met in George Burnett's office. And I thought, something's up. Then he asked me to bring my wife, CJ. Well, it doesn't get any more unusual than that. And she was at work. And I said, well, uh, no, she, she's working, but I'll see you at two o'clock. Nothing had happened to that point, or at least been announced. So I walk into George Burnett's office. His wife is there, and I'm thinking, something's not right. And I was expecting the worst for some reason. Uh, and he said, you know what? I don't know how to tell you this, uh, so here it is. I've sold the team. It's moving to Hamilton next year. Board of Governors is meeting in an hour to uh, make uh, make it final. It was just like that. And uh, I think, Mike, you and I talked that night, if I'm not mistaken. We did. Uh, it, it had come down just like that, like bang. I was on city council here at the time, and I called the mayor to let him know what was going on. On my way out of the office, uh, and I thought, okay, I'm going to get back to the radio station. Um, Simmons says to me, uh, I would appreciate it if you wouldn't say anything until after the board meets. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, you know what, any loyalties I may have had in the past year are gone. Uh, I have a job to do. And I walked out. So put the thing out in the afternoon still trying to come to grips with this whole thing because we've still got seven games left in the regular season. Uh, now you've got a full lame duck situation. The final games, the home games, they were almost all sold out. Uh, the nostalgia had taken over the community, former players who had come back and so on. But I guess the irony was the very next night, the Friday night, uh, we're playing Kingston. And so Larry Mavity is there, of course, and Mav was there through all the beginnings and, and I asked him to come on the air so we could talk about all of this. But um, he had come over and well, we were in break or something and both of us had a tear in our eye uh, because the loss, even though he had left years earlier, he had put a lot of his life into that franchise and it was still his hometown. Uh, just the shock that came because there was no there was no rhyme or reason that the announcement would be right then. We're talking March, and the league had a deadline that if you're going to move a franchise, it, it had to be done, uh, like all the decisions made by December 31st of the prior year. And Simmons had said right along, the team was not for sale. Mark Crawford uh, had put together a group locally that wanted to buy it, and they were rebuffed and basically said, uh, no, it's not for sale that year. So on different occasions when Gord had been approached about selling the team, it was never for sale. I told him there might be some interest out of Kingston if he was ever thinking about it. And he said, not for sale. So the fact that he wasn't selling it, uh, and then all of a sudden announced he did, uh, it came months after the deadline. And it was like just so fast. Uh, it, it was like more than a slap in the face to everybody. They just didn't see it coming. Jack, you're, you're in a pretty unique position, having been with a franchise as it, it grew into the Ontario Hockey League. And we referenced those games of the week broadcasts that you were a part of when the Ontario Hockey League had that opportunity on Saturday afternoons to showcase itself. Over all of these years, when you think on major junior hockey in Canada, because I know you've got that world junior experience as well, but specifically when you consider the Ontario Hockey League and, and Major Junior, does it get its due in this country, do you think? I think so. Uh, I'm not sure it may be so much in parts of Quebec where you see attendance uh, 1,500, 1,600 a game. Uh, clearly, the way it has developed over the years, and let's face it, it's pretty professionally operated at every level as opposed to the quote unquote ma and pa operations of way back when. I remember when the OHL office, when we came into being was three people, uh, David Branch, Herb Morell, and usually somebody who was uh, selling corporate stuff and, and, and a secretary. And that was the extent of the OHL office back in the day. Well, things have developed and, and let's be honest, the league has grown. Uh, it's got some very vibrant 
markets. There's probably a couple that aren't as vibrant, but winning can change all of that. I, I think it does. And the national attention that it gets through the television contracts. We were the big fish back at the time, the OHL game of the week, because it was the only network telecast. It, it predated TSN. Uh, it predated Sportsnet, obviously. And, and their games, when they did come along, the uh, Saturday afternoon games used to get much higher ratings than what the national audiences were uh, the next night. So I think, especially in Ontario, I think it does. Um, nationally, the Western Hockey League seems to do very well. Uh, as I say, the Quebec League, it's been around for, for a long time and, and they have their premier markets. They seem to have uh, some that aren't so good. But bottom line is, I think junior hockey gets us due because I see what happens in the States, for instance, where it doesn't. Uh, they don't have major junior except in a, in a few places in the Western League in Ontario. Uh, but basically, it's all Tier 2 hockey, whether it's the North American Hockey League or, or whatever it might be. They don't get anywhere near the attention that you would see it here in Canada. Calling games in the American League now for Belleville Senators, how much do you miss the Ontario Hockey League? I've got to be honest, uh, not a lot. Um, I spent 34 years doing OHL games, so mm -hmm. obviously it's a big part of my life, and I enjoyed it. I truly, truly did. The American Hockey League's not far off from the NHL. Mm -hmm. uh, the operations are different, uh, certainly in terms of um, the arenas in most Cases, uh, you're looking at a lot of pro arenas. Like when we go into Cleveland and, and you're playing out of, you know, the same building the Cleveland Cavaliers are playing in and, and others like that. But then you can go to Utica and their building is smaller than ours. So it's kind of a mishmash. But bottom line is the hockey's really good. And, and that's the biggest difference of it. Like I can think of times, and you guys have probably been through this too, where you've got a team that's struggling. Well, Kitchener doesn't do that very often, but, you know, Belvin would have some years where struggle and, and calling a game would be tough. Uh, in the American Hockey League, even when a team is struggling, they're one goal games. You don't get too many blowouts and just the nature of the game, because so many of these guys, they're, they're in your lineup one night and they're in the NHL the next. And that's the back and forth of it. And like even the worst pro is going to be better than most juniors, uh, no matter how you cut it. So the level of hockey has been a pleasure to call. Uh, certainly, we're we're just such a small entity in the American Hockey League in Belleville, and wondering if it was going to work or not. Uh, there's still some work to be done in that respect, but at the same time, the, the hockey, the level of hockey guys, outstanding. And like I say, you're one level below the NHL. Last year, Belleville had. 178 transactions or something. That's the tough part. Moving between Brampton of the ECHL to Belleville, Belleville to the NHL. But Ottawa had so many injuries the last two years. Guys back and forth from Ottawa to Belleville. It was, it was just a standard week in the American Hockey League uh, with the Belleville Senators. That's the tough part. Uh, you don't get that kind of roster turnover in the Ontario Hockey League. And that was one thing. You've got players in the OHL. And that was one thing I really did like, uh, is that players are going to be around for a few years for the most part. Uh, you're going to get to know them. You're going to watch them grow as a player and as a person. And that, that is really fun. And for the fans, it's a lot of fun. Uh, in this case, the players may be better, but they may be around a year or two, maybe three. Uh, they're going to be up and back. And if Ottawa likes them, they're gone. Uh, so fans have never gotten used to that aspect of the American Hockey League. And even for me, uh, you get a roster of some teams, Utica, for instance, and they, well, we've got 31 players on the roster. <laughs> you wouldn't see that in junior. And then it's okay. Uh, which 20 are going to be dressed for any given night? There's challenges with that, but that's our problem. Bottom line is the hockey is great. And as such, I've enjoyed calling it. You talked about arenas and, and we touched on the Yardmen earlier and you mentioned the facelift which unfortunately in my opinion took away one of the most unique aspects of it right when you were talking about Peterborough and the and the rinky dink or the smaller ice you had the international sized ice at the yard when you had the bull's head the big bull's head mounted to the wall it felt like a barn how much of an advantage though was that ice surface for the home team 
I think early on, uh, it was a big advantage because let's, especially when teams from the West were coming in, uh, Windsor, London, Owen Sound, they all had these small arenas at the time, small licenses. They come over and, and one player, I remember he described the Yardman arenas looking like Lake Erie. Uh, so why? Because it was international dimensions. It was, uh, it was 100 by 200, and it created some interesting things for them. Now, teams that came in a lot, uh, it wasn't as big an advantage for Belleville. But if you had a team that really couldn't skate well or handle the big ice, then you're on it 34 games of the year. It, it could be a detriment. I would say over the years, it was a, it was a plus. But it wasn't the same kind of a game in Belleville. It wasn't going to be as physical a game in Belleville. Usually, defensemen were afraid to go too wide. Uh, so any kind of, of contact on the boards, it wasn't there like it would be in a normal-sized arena. Uh, goaltenders, they would misplay the angles until they could adjust them. So it was an advantage for Belleville. There's no two ways about it. But as hockey progressed, and we've seen the level of play in the Ontario Hockey League, obviously, uh, grow significantly over the years where skill took over from what used to be a physical game. Uh, now skill has taken over and players can handle that. And so it wasn't as much of an advantage uh, as years went by uh, because most teams could come in and they could handle it uh, as well as anybody because you always had good skating uh, teams that would come in and certainly every team had their share of highly skilled players. And so as years went on, uh, the home ice advantage aspect of it began to diminish. Kind of reminds me, bringing it locally, to the old, like, Almira Arena, where the seats are right up against the glass. And, like, as a player, you feel like you're in this tight little bubble. I can only imagine those green seats alone just intimidate you when and they start – you know, doing the cowbell when they're coming out, I'd be terrified <laughs> as, a, as a visitor. What was one of the most, uh, let, let's say, crazy things you saw in that arena? Oh, where do I start? Uh, I mean, we're talking about uh, hockey back in the, uh, in the early 80s, but probably the weirdest thing I ever saw were the Cooperalls, uh, <laughs> when all the players had to, to wear those uh, somewhere around 83, 84, whatever. And thankfully, uh, people used to think that, Players were in their pajamas uh, out there. They're playing. There's a balcony on, on the south side. And so it was all season ticket holders in the day. And one particular season ticket holder is Sun played for the Bulls. Uh, I won't tell you who it is. Nonetheless, there used to be, believe it or not, alcohol involved with some of these fans. I, yeah, no, I know. No. I know. <laughs> wow. Well, anyhow, Bulls in this one yeah, well... <laughs> In this one particular game, um, like that's not a very high balcony. I mean, it overlooks the ice. And this one player's father, and he'd had a few before the game, obviously he, he had a couple of cocktails at dinner. His son gets a penalty during the game, and he didn't like the call. The father didn't like the call. Pill picks up this big ceramic garbage can and heaves it onto the ice, and he didn't have to throw it far. And because it was ceramic, it shattered. Everybody could see where it came from. Everybody could see who threw it. There was nothing subversive about it. It was like, because I'm sure he yelled something at the time, out on the ice it flies and, and away you go. Um, between that, the many brawls back in the old days that uh, you used to have, Craig Billington, uh, Belleville's playing Brantford, and Alan Bester is a goaltender with Brantford, not a big guy. Greg Billington, not a big guy. The, the brawl was complete, like both benches are emptied, so the goaltenders end up coming to center, and neither one of them weighed more than 160 pounds, trying to fight. And it was the funniest thing watching this because they've got the goalie equipment in, and you know people like a good goalie fight. This was not. And, uh, so, but yeah, that was pretty strange back in the day. Jack, that's the second time Brantford's name has come up. Obviously the, the now defunct Alexanders, you mentioned the Guelph Platers before we know Guelph is still in the league, but back is the storm after the Platers moved to Owen Sound, et cetera. I'm on a personal mission. I'm going to tell you right now to get Cornwall back in this league. I've got no skin in the game. 
I don't know much, but I, I'd love to see it. Is there a market that you miss or a market that you think the Ontario Hockey League should be back in? Belleville. <laughs> uh, well, I'm afraid that won't be happening anytime soon, no matter what. Uh, the Senators are going to be in Belleville for a long time. Uh, they have another seven or eight years left on their lease and then some options on top. Be that as it may, I know a lot of people in Belleville, Chris, would like to see junior hockey back. And I'm aware that there was a team uh, in the league that looked at Belleville almost immediately and were asking about the city's plans for the arena and what they were going to do. So uh, this is before Ottawa had come online, but it was officially at least, but uh, the talks were underway, as I understand it. But there was a team that, that was looking. I don't know if Cornwall will do it. Um, the problem with Cornwall, and I'm originally from Cornwall. I grew up with the Royals. Uh, I've been here since I'm 20 years old in Belleville. Um, the rink is the same age as ours. Uh, they added some seats years ago. It's a nice complex. But when they had the OHL, it wasn't supported because maybe it was timing. They had won Memorial Cups in Quebec, in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. And Cornwall shifted from the Quebec League to Ontario the year the Bulls joined the OHL. And so we had that connection in that respect. But I can tell you that it wasn't well supported over the years. And then they had an American Hockey League team. It was the Quebec Ramparts team or Quebec uh, Nordiques team at the time. And, and it wasn't particularly well supported and they haven't had it since. Cornwall market wise would be good. And I'm sure Ottawa would like to see it and Kingston would like to see it, especially with Belleville no longer in that Eastern Ontario corridor, whether or not they're ready or won't even want it. They have tier two hockey there. Uh, they're close to Montreal. They're close to Ottawa. If they want in a big, you know, NHL wise. Um, but it's been gone so long. I'm not sure that it would work. Uh, back to Belleville, not too, just a couple months ago, um, Pauline Crawford passed away. You mentioned mm -hmm. Mark Crawford's name, um, obviously Lou, the coach in 99. What's that family mean to Belleville in the area? Well, they're Belleville's first family of, of hockey, obviously, and, and of sports. Um, the sister uh, was outstanding track and field. Uh, Todd Crawford, who's a local teacher, uh, he was an Olympian, bobsled. Uh, I think he was in Calgary. Uh, he's been a master track and field guy since coaches a lot of uh, the teams out of uh, Moira Secondary, which is now Eastside Secondary. But yet, uh, there's others uh, as well. Um, there's a brother, Eric, who is uh, involved with player development with the Montreal Canadiens and for years uh, was with Mark in Vancouver when he was there. And so you've got a family that they all played the game. Um, Peter, who uh, is now a successful businessman in the St. Louis area, uh, Bobby Crawford, uh, who played in the NHL for years, scored over 40 for the Hartford Whalers one year and very successfully stayed in Hartford and, and as a businessman. Uh, the Crawford family, I mean, that's, that's deity when it comes to not only sports, but especially hockey. And, and Floyd stayed in it. Uh, he coached the Junior B team for a number of years, took them and won a Sutherland Cup uh, one year, which is an Ontario Junior B championship. So they've always been there. And Mark is a player, and, and for the most part, he was a minor leaguer, did play somewhat with Vancouver. But, you know, coaches coming up through Cornwall, his father Floyd coached in Cornwall for a year. Uh, so they've always been there. And Floyd, you have to remember, he was the captain of the 1959 McFarlands. I'm sure, Chris, you remember that. Uh, the 1959 McFarlands won the world championship. This is the world championship as we know it today, where we send our best players. But back in 1959, the team that won the Allen Cup went to the world championships. And Floyd Crawford was the captain of that team that won the world title. Uh, in Czechoslovakia back in the day. And so this goes way back for decades and decades and decades. And then the kids just kind of picked up where Floyd left off and he never left the game. He was either scouting. And he scouted for the Bulls for years. He was the head scout. Uh, one of his sons, Mike, was also on the scouting staff. Uh, he, as I say, he coached a junior B team when they were here, the Bobcats. And uh, 
plus Floyd coached in Guelph for a year, uh, coached, coached in Cornwall, so they've always been front and center. We touched on that 99 championship team. Obviously, the Bulls had the run to the OHL final in 08. Uh, is there, and I know it's kind of like picking a favorite child, Jack, but is there a player or a season that stood out for you with the Belleville Bulls in your time? Um, there were a lot of players over the years that, that really stood out to me because of not just what they did on the ice. I mean, you can always, over 34 years, you're going to see dozens and dozens and dozens of players that, that will be unforgettable for what they did on the ice. I always remember early on, Craig Billington was one of those guys. He was just such a nice guy, a practical guy. He played uh, with Belleville earlier 80s to the mid 80s uh, before he got drafted by New Jersey. And back in those days, you didn't have video, but he would have his billet bring a camcorder to the games and tape them. And, and he was so analytical. And to this day, I think he is now the assistant general manager of the Colorado Avalanche. Guys like that. Darren McCarty was another one uh, on the ice. Fearsome, could score you 50 goals. He'll get you 150 penalty minutes. He'll get you 100 points overall. He wore the captain C because of the leadership uh, qualities. And, and Darren McCarty was, again, one of those guys that never took a game off, always came to play. Off the ice, great with kids. Uh, so many of them, because in a smaller community, uh, it's so much easier to interact. I, I always like the fact that players that have come in here, quite a few of them over the years have won uh, the the award that the OHL has for community service. And a number of Belleville players over the years have won it because they've gotten involved in the community. So to uh, to take it down to one team, certainly the 99 team was one you're not going to forget, but there were others down over the, the years that maybe weren't quite as talented, but they, they had off the ice, a presence in the community, nice people interacted well on the ice would put it all out there. Uh, you never had to question the fact that they came to work every game, whether they got a win or a loss, uh, no matter what, you would never ever question uh, their work ethic. And that was sort of the mark of Belleville teams over the years that no matter what happened, that they're going to be the hardest working team on the ice. And, and that endears people like me to what they do. We, Mike mentioned that uh, 08 final against Kitchener, the man behind the bench. I didn't that year. who that was against. I just said oh. they had the... <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> the man behind the bench, still in the league, George Burnett. Uh, I don't know if he listens to this podcast. He's been on a couple times. But what was it like dealing with the infamous George Burnett? Well, you can call him infamous. Uh, I, I had known George for years uh, just because he'd been in the league uh, in Niagara Falls, obviously. And then before he came to us, he was in Guelph and won a uh, championship back in, in 98. Uh, he'd be coming our way after a number of years in Oshawa. So, so I knew George pretty well. You have to remember, and again, you're dealing with different personalities. And it's ironic you bring up George. He texted me the other day about Larry Mavity as he, he knew we were close. Uh, George and Mav couldn't have been more polar opposite in so many ways. Uh, George was soft-spoken. Uh, obviously, uh, he, he was one of those people, never drank. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, Mav, on the other hand, uh, was not soft-spoken. Uh, <laughs> he didn't mind getting, you know, having a party. Uh, those traits aside, they were very similar in a lot of ways. Their word was their bond. When they told somebody something, to their, uh, the best of what they could tell you at that time, that's the way it was going to be. Both honest. Uh, they traded a lot. Uh, they, you know, uh, let's be honest. Uh, you know, Mab was known as Trader Mab in the day to get the players he wanted. But George did a lot of trading in his time as well. So we were kind of used to that aspect of it. But they went about their, their work a little bit differently. And uh, George was always up front with me. I was always up front with him. I had no issues whatsoever with George Burnett. Uh, like I said, I liked his honesty. Uh, he was open with me uh, from the media perspective. Um, anything I ever need, he made sure I had. And he would tell me stuff that maybe wasn't for broadcast purposes, but just to give me 
a foundation of something that might happen so you have a better understanding of it. Um, I like George Burnett and the fact that he's still doing it today and uh, doing it very well. Speaks a lot for the man and the way he has adjusted as the game has changed over the years. Uh, he's adjusted big time. And I saw it here when Jake Grimes was the assistant coach. Uh, here when George got here in 2004. And Jake was with him until the team left. And could have had head coaching opportunities elsewhere. He has now gone to the Quebec League as a coach and GM. But the fact that he would stay as long as he did shows you the respect factor that George not only had as a coach, but as a teacher. And that's, that was his trade. He was a teacher by trade and he carried it to the coaching position. You might say, well, that's the job of a coach, but in junior hockey, it really is the job of the coach. And, and George was a good teacher, but not only for his players, for the people who worked for him as well. And so the George Burnett experience for me was nothing but great. And I don't say that just in case he's watching. You'll be happy to know his relationship with the media hasn't changed. I don't think he's turned down Farwell and I once for an interview. And we've bothered him a lot over the last five years. Oh, I'm, and I'm sure you have. And, and he never will. He, that, that was the nice thing about George. He understood everybody's job. Uh, and we all had a job to do. And, and I more so being the team broadcaster. So, uh, you know, we'd have to do interviews before every game for the pregame show and how many times afterward. But he was... He was the same with everybody, and and you're right. I, I never saw him turn down anybody's request for an interview, and and he he gave them the time, and he didn't just kind of slough you off. I know there were some days I'd go in there to do the pregame show, and I'd have to ask about 19 questions to get three minutes out of him. But other things might be on his mind. But other times I'd go in and maybe three questions, and bang, we're done, uh, because you know he was uh, in a talkative mood. All coaches are like that, but. Uh, you know, George, as I say, I've seen both sides of the coaching gamut, uh, what it used to be like, what it is today, and you have to admire coaches that can transcend from what it used to be to what it is. I mean, when George was first hired, it was a funny story. Um, I think it was Bill LaForge, I could be wrong, that had been fired in Niagara Falls, and George was a junior C coach at the time and teaching. So he gets hired as coach of Niagara Falls Thunder. He had never met his team. They're playing in Peterborough, and he didn't live that far from Peterborough. So he drives to Peterborough, and he steps on the bench. The game had just started. He'd never met his players. And, you know, they hand him a lineup card and say, go to it. You're an OHL coach. That's late 80s. And he's a coach of the year within a year or two of that. Uh, and the game was different then. And he was able to coach a team that played on a really small ice surface in Niagara Falls. He could coach the teams on the big ice surface in Belleville. Uh, but he was also, more importantly, able to adapt to the way the game has changed. And that uh, everybody's better off for it. You know, Jack, I'm not just saying this to Curry favor, but I've always had a soft spot for the Quinty region. I miss those Saturday nights in Belleville. I really do on the Eastern swing for us Westerners here in the OHL and uh, seeing you at least that one time through is a big part of that. Uh, this has been fun. Thanks for making the time. Oh, my pleasure. We didn't even get to the part of Kitchener and how nobody wanted to go to the old press box or all the seats in between the two benches back in the day, guys. That was interesting. That should be another day. <laughs> I have one more quick one. Can I, can I bother you just real quick? And it's the broadcast nerd to me. Was it about kindergarten or grade one that someone heard you speak and say, oh, you're going into broadcasting? Because those well, pipes are unbelievable. Well, thanks. Uh, I, I went to uh, Queens for political studies, uh, but I used to do the announcements at school. I was never a very good athlete, so I would uh, call the games. So I guess it's been in me for a long time. Uh, put a microphone anywhere within... Oh, say 70 feet. Uh, normally, I'd find my way over to it. You wouldn't even have to move your feet. Your voice would just be picked up 70 no. feet away. <laughs> it wasn't so much that anybody was pointing me in that direction. I, I think I just naturally tended to follow. I think we just got confirmation, too, that Jack will make a return appearance on this podcast because there are more stories to be shared. Mr. Miller, it's, it's been great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Chris, good to see you.